Do you want to get a job in closure? Well, you're in luck because today I am talking with Nick Mirage. He works at Functional Works, which is a recruiting firm out in London. They work all over the world, but they specialize in functional programming jobs. And we talk a lot about how to differentiate yourself, how to prepare for the interview, how many jobs are out there, what are employers looking for, a whole bunch of stuff that should be useful to anyone who's looking for a job or is looking to hire a closure programmer. So please enjoy this discussion I have with Nick Marash. So Nick, uh, can you tell me a bit about yourself? Absolutely. I'm one of the partners here at Functional Works. We are a, I guess we have a little bit of a hybrid uh, thing going on here. We are recruitment meets technology. Um, we are trying to create an online marketplace for software engineers to find their niche, find work, help tech teams grow. We are doing this via technology and openness and transparency. Um, I think we have all felt a little bit um, frustrated by the recruitment industry. Uh -huh. and things being a little bit um, hidden and opaque. And so we have decided to fix that um, using yeah, data and uh, obviously some human insight too, um, but all leveraged by technology. So yeah, I head up um, uh, US desk here and um, we are uh, slowly growing <laughs> our presence Great. in the US. But um, obviously, I joined to uh, initially grow our UK office. Okay, and so you focus on recruiting for functional languages. So yeah, we have a larger Works Hub brand that um, you know, enables us to support very specialized niches. Functional Works was our homegrown initial niche. Mm -hmm. um, the community has been absolutely fantastic. Um, they gathered behind us you know, hugely and it really helped us to grow and, and I guess provide this proof of concept. If we create a place that provides information, technology, um, you know, gives back to the community and brings everybody together on a global scale, um, you know, we can actually get the recruitment job done. Uh -huh. This is a side, side effect of you know, engaging this community. Um, <clears throat> Friend, um, that is bringing together functional programming community globally to help share ideas, offer insights into what's going on, but fundamentally help tech teams find great functional engineers. I see. So um, you you mentioned um, a couple of languages, but what 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 do you consider to be a functional language? That's a good question, and um, I think uh, we have that debate quite a lot uh, at our meetup that we run in London, London Functionals. Um, it's been quite a popular uh, topic. There are always going to be purists out there, uh -huh. and I think uh, you know it's always good to have healthy debate. The reality is we live in a very commercial world, and as I'm sure we'll discuss a little bit more later on, this functional mindset and style of coding and approaching right. how you actually build applications and use these techniques to scale and use them for their benefits can be applied in a lot of languages. Uh -huh. So of course, you know, there are the strong typed, you know, particularly, um, I guess the fanboys in particular are these, you know, the Haskells um, out here. But then there's, you know, a, a large kind of gray area in between. And, you know, we can't deny the fact that Scala is huge and popular. Right. And, you know, some purists would, you know, argue whether or not it was, you know, a real functional language or pure functional language. Um, but, you know, people out there building things, solving problems would argue, you know, using any language in the right way, obviously it will need some sort of functionality within it, right. um, you know, can be classed or at least in some part as a functional language. So we have our core languages, of course, sure. and we are understanding and open-minded of how we can use technology in interesting ways in the functional mindset. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so one thing that people ask me all the time uh, is, are there jobs in closure? 
Um, it's kind of it's kind of a weird situation because the employers are saying there aren't any employees, and the employees or the people who would be employees are saying there aren't any jobs. Um, what are there jobs? Where are they? What 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 should someone do? There are jobs. I think um, you know, for someone in my position, it's very easy for us to put you know put things into a kind of uh, a scale, you know, compared to the rest of the market. So, you know, we see you know, 100% of the market. Of that 100%, of course, closure is a very, very small, growing, but small, you know, section of that. So, relatively, there are fewer jobs. And I can understand that frustration from the perspective of a candidate trying to find work. Mm. When you go out there looking at jobs, you know, it will feel as if it's very underrepresented as a technology. Right. Um, and I can also understand how an employer who was making the decision may feel there's a lack of talent. Uh -huh. um, I would say that's a fallacy, though, um, for reasons we'll probably get into. But you know, anyone can be a great closure you know, engineer. Um, so to say there aren't enough closure engineers is probably not a you know a logical line of reasoning. Um, however, there is of course a little bit of a chicken egg scenario. And you know, until there's a big move made, um, and the community really can, I guess, mimic in a way what the Scala community has done. Um, yeah. Well, so one does, thing, one thing that people often will show me, you know, they're like, "There's not any closure jobs." They'll go and they'll search, let's say, Scala, on a job board, and there's two thousand, and then they search for closure, and there's seventeen, and they say, "You see." And I'm like, but there's 17, and you only need one. Like, you only need one. So why, you're not going to apply to all 2,000. Look at the 17 and, and see if they're a good fit. Like, it's, am I wrong? Is this not a good approach? Is there something to just quantity of jobs? Because it yeah, seems I mean, like they can't all be good jobs. <laughs> Right. Absolutely. I mean, you've kind of nailed it just at the end there. Um, it's all very well there are 17 jobs. You know, you tell that to 18 people. The reality is, Scala. I'll, I'll use Scala as the example because it's you know successfully transitioned into mainstream. Um, although some purists, you know, wouldn't call it necessarily uh, pure language. But um, you know, the 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 companies that are you know that these you know, these small jobs, uh, this small selection of jobs you know, in a closure market. Um, because of the decision process that's gone through you know, these people's minds, you know, why are they choosing sco sco uh, closure? They're a particular type of person. They are, you know, they're keeping up to date with technology. They've also played around in their spare time. You know, they're these kind of curious polyglot types usually, um, and you know, they see something in it that mm -hmm. could be of value. Obviously, there'll be the odd, you know, just fanboy here and there who just wants to do it. But in general, from my, exp my experience with these companies, is there is a dis there is a particular decision and they have gone with this language for a reason right. that will be a filter um it's obviously most likely to be a new business because you're not going to do a huge you know legacy migration into closure either right. um it's quite often it will be something new and nimble and interesting that means the quality of work is probably going to be higher and that uh -huh. is consistent with what i see even in a huge corporation say like um city group you know that have closure teams you know that was a new bit of technology it wasn't you know a huge migration there were elements of that but in general this technology is adopted to do something new right scala is mature it's you know it's well integrated it's been around for a long time you're quite right there's lots of poor quality scala work out there uh -huh. which when you do a search online and it's like oh my gosh there's so much work right yeah okay and you know I, not all of our clients are rock star clients. <laughs> There's stuff out there. It's still pretty stodgy work, but someone's got to do it. Right, right. So I, think, I mean, you know, it's, it, a, it's a bit like um, back in the like late 90s, um, Python wasn't that popular. And so Python was a good filter to find good programmers because it was probably their second language or maybe more. And the fact that they were curious enough to try out this obscure language was a good indicator that they were a good programmer in general, um, at least better than average. So it was a good way to filter by just making your startup only use Python. And what you said there is you know, really behind the philosophy of you know, functional works as a community. Um, you know, although you know, we're careful with our language, you know, we do really believe that 
you know, somebody that's taken the time to investigate the paradigm, he's spent time, you know, outside of core hours to go and, you know, practice, learn, put things out there, you know, engage with a community. It does give a signal of a certain type of engineer. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could say that, you know, a, a newer language like Clojure is, again, a subset within a subset. Um, Scala as a skill set, commercial skill set, isn't necessarily a huge filter anymore. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, somebody who maybe has used some other languages, other technologies, it definitely does give us an idea of what kind of person they are, um, sure. given the sort of time scales. Um, okay, so I guess what you're saying is, uh, just to summarize, there are jobs out there, and it's it could be an advantage that it, it's still small. Yes, I think you know we need to appreciate that these things take time, um, and everybody has a part to play. So yes, companies need to be open-minded and appreciate what a great engineer is. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that there is still a shortage of closure programmers. Okay. From my experience, people are finding it hard to find these people. Okay. But I wouldn't say that these companies are necessarily looking for you know, closure developers. Uh -huh. right. They're looking for great engineers, like okay. everybody is. And that's but, hard to you know, find in general. Right, a good programmer is just harder to find. <laughs> so this okay. is it. You know, I think it's very easy to get you know sidetracked. You start talking about something. You know, it's this kind of causality thing. But actually, we're, the problem we're talking about is finding great talent, uh -huh. and you know, finding great people who are also willing or have used closure. It's just so it's lost within this greater problem of trying to find a great engineer. Um, that being said, coming back to my point, you know. Um, you know, companies are open-minded and just want to speak to great engineers who have potential and have looked at the paradigm, for example. That's absolutely great. Um, but at the same time, you know, we need individuals to, you know, get their work out there, you know, be visible, be public, go and investigate these technologies okay. and you know, provide that data to the market. You know, companies like us are constantly trawling through, you know, resources online. Uh, like GitHub or Stack Overflow, and these are the only real metric we have of how many people are out there engaging with this technology. Mm -hmm. And that is the information that employers see. And if they feel as if it's not a huge market, you know, we get this chicken and egg scenario going on. Right. But the reality is, you know, if people just go, um, you know, and you know, learn learn this technology, um, invest time, you know, engaging with online communities. You know, as a force, great things can happen. People will create create great tools. People will, you know, create this um, you know resource of technology behind it, like the Scala community has done through commercial necessity. Right. Um, and that will, in turn, kind of you know snowball and allow companies to feel as if actually there's a big community out there that's doing things for the language. Um, and you know, you only need one or two key players, you know, on the kind of commercial side of things. You know, I always think about you know the really kind of I guess the kind of uh, Scala consultancies. I mean, I guess Cake Solutions, you know, is one um, that actually started here in the UK. I mean, even from before Lab Forty Nine, you know, more of a sort of fintech consultancy. These are you know groups of people that really pushed languages. You know, Scala um, has been you know brought into large organisations on an enterprise scale thanks right. in part to companies like this. These are just small, you know, small consultancies. Some, you know, sometimes, and it's just a handful of people that are very passionate about technology. You know, they engage with the community. They've got a huge amount of support. They've got access to talent. Mm -hmm. This isn't some higher power creating this. You know, it is yeah. emergent kind of behaviour, and it's you know all those little parts all coming together to create uh -huh. some momentum, and then you know all of a sudden, bam! You've got a huge enterprise scale closure project at whatever bank or whatever dot com, right. and then that's it. You know, then that company adopts it. They start pouring more resources and research back into the open source community, and then bam, 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 it escalates. I see. That's where we're at, you know, with Clojure, it just needs that that little step forward, you know, where people just keep blind faith, <laughs> creating things, building tools, getting on with it. And you know, from my perspective, I've seen these things kind of just suddenly escalate. And you only really do need, you know, one or two big businesses to go for it, and then you've got that little, you know, um, that cycle you know, working for you. I see. Okay, um, so let's get down to like the individual candidate, like someone who wants to get a job in closure. Um, what? I guess this this is kind of a complicated question because everyone comes from a different place. Mm. What 
what do companies look for? What do you advise them to look for? Um, is do they need to know a ton of closure? Like, you know, I'll see a lot of job descriptions that say you need five years of experience with closure. Like the number of people who have that much closure mm -hmm. experience is like professional experience is actually pretty low. Um, mm -hmm. So what 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 do you recommend? I think as a general rule, you know, I wouldn't take job specs too seriously. Um, <clears throat> you know, I can definitely speak from personal experience that, you know, you, at some point you've just had to write a job spec. Uh -huh. uh, pretty much every job spec in the world, you know, I'll say 95% of them, somebody has just has to sit there and go, hmm, how do I describe this complicated role? Um, so, you know, apart from maybe the huge organizations, you know, most job specs are just a guideline. Um, and obviously, you know, ridiculous things like that uh, can be ignored in general. I think um, I, what I'm going to say is going to sound a little bit counterintuitive, but, you know, it's not really about having the mastery of a language. Uh -huh. um, and I think this is across the board. Of course, every single company has its own nuances. So this is a very broad opinion when looking at you know, the wider market. So ignoring particular nuances within businesses, um, what we're coming back to is this idea of a great engineer. Now, a great engineer, somebody that has come from more likely more of a kind of polyglot mindset, uh, somebody that has you know, a, a strong grounding in the computer science fundamentals, you know, has been out there and built things, um, has a commercial and pragmatic attitude. Uh -huh. These people are curious people anyway. They've had to solve problems. You know, they do reading, they speak to friends and peers. These people will naturally pick up languages along the way. And it's that sort of curiosity that may, you know, find somebody sitting down with some closure books over the weekend, right. getting their head around a paradigm, getting their head around the syntax, getting their head around the toolings and everything that's there and going, hmm, actually, this is interesting. And for whatever reason, it may just be, wow, I love coding this stuff, <laughs> or, wow, this is a very useful tool. Sure. Gets a little bit more involved in that route. That is the person we're looking for. You know, there is a flip side, you know, a flip side person here that is just learning things top down and saying, oh, yeah, I'm just going to learn some closure. Oh, I'm going to learn this thing. Oh, that looks cool. I'm going to job in that. But if you don't have this kind of foundational experience and knowledge, then that's very superficial, uh -huh. you know, gained kind of expertise. And you're kind of missing the whole story here of, you need to go and build things to solve problems. In a so would you world. recommend someone do projects in, in their spare time and put them in their resume? Um, I think that's really important because you need to be visible. Um, however, I think it's really important to you know, get peer review. It's something we talk about a lot here is you can sit on your own and build all sorts of junk. <laughs> uh -huh. um, who's going to see it? You know, are you actually becoming a better right. software engineer? You know, how well are you testing your code? Are you documenting things well? You know, is this an elegant solution? These are things that are going to trip you up in interviews and cause more havoc than, oh, yeah, I memorized, you know, all this whole library and closure. Yeah. It's like you can get through a high level interview based on just the nuances of closure. But the reality is people don't necessarily need that. They have chosen this technology. If you're a great engineer, they will have faith you'll get up to speed. Now, also, like I say, I can't talk for every single business, and we do have a couple that are just need people to hit the ground running, get on with it. But in general, you'll find companies are very, very open-minded. They just want these good, robust engineers that understand the paradigm, uh -huh. get it, are interested in it. Well, guess what? You're going to become a master in it here. That is the majority of the market. That okay, we see. So, so let me see if I understand. You're, you're saying... You recommend that people understand the fundamentals, get a job in closure, and then you will learn it on the job. Is Don't that... think that you know not knowing closure is going to stop you getting a job at a great firm. Any company that's really worth work working for is going to see the value in you and the potential in you, and you will learn closure. Okay. I see. That 
are you know, setting out a two, three hour assignment um, enclosure and then read through that test, judging the syntax, judging the decisions and going, this person is not an expert in closure. The problems these companies are facing are not closure problems. They are engineering problems and closure is a means to solving these problems. <clears throat> so I think this is something, again, it does come around to, you know, people's, um, this kind of purist, you know, kind of, I guess, mindset with some technologies and it's the friction I do get with the market sometimes. Some people want to write Clojure or Haskell or whatever because they love writing that language. Whereas that's fine out in your personal life and on research projects and what have you. But the reality is this is a commercial world and someone's going to pay you to solve their problems. So just wanting to write closure because you love to write closure may not sit so well with all the employers out there. They need a great engineer who will use closure to solve their problems. For sure. There's obviously going to be a middle ground there where it makes everybody happy and you'll get paid. Great. But I think it's understanding what is your value to that client? And what is your value to that business? Are you right. going to solve their problems? Because guess what? If in a year's time they go, actually, closure is not working for us, and they switch to something else, are you cool with that? No? <laughs> so, you know, I think this is something that's important. It's like right. people need great engineers, first and for, you know, first most. Yeah, I actually really appreciate that um, attitude. I, you know, I, I really, so many people are like, how much closure do I need to learn to be hireable, right? Yeah. And I think that, it, it, I, I see where they're coming from. A lot of the job descriptions will say, you must be an expert in closure. And, um, but like you said, it's just someone sitting down and writing a description because they were told we need a closure programmer and they just put it up on some job site. Um, but really, at the end of the day, they want someone with, um, with good ideas and, and good mm -hmm. skills to, to build stuff. Um, Most of the market is like that anyway, regardless of the technology. You know, don't get me wrong, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, we've got some huge legacy system built in closure and um, you know, this is a real kind of business as usual kind of role, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm sure at that point, they'll need somebody who's an expert and can navigate this horrific field of a code base. Um, the, the, the language is just not there at the moment um, in its maturity. So those sort of roles are almost non-existent. Whereas, you know, for Scala, like we mentioned earlier, you know, there are probably some pretty murky old code bases out there. And um, you're probably gonna have to be a bit of a, an expert to get on board, hit the ground running, and you know, fix some of those problems. Cool. So, how should someone who doesn't know closure, who wants to learn it on the job, how should they prepare for an interview? So, again, it kind of comes back to what we've been talking about here. Um, there will obviously be, you know, a little bit of, you know, uh, talking about technologies that a company uses, but as is always the case, you know, the best companies out there, the ones that I really respect. The ones that you know we have had ongoing relationships with for years and years really are assessing something a little bit deeper. Okay. Um, it's not the end of the world that you may decide to answer some questions in a different language, because feel it's the right thing to do. You know, in in that circumstance, understanding the paradigm um, and understanding these kind of like underlying, you know, forces that are there are going to help you get ahead a lot more than just some kind of, you know, higher level nuances of that particular language. Right. So let's say someone's a JavaScript programmer. Should mm -hmm. they jump in and start using map filter and reduce if they're appropriate, obviously? I have always said, you know, people should be curious and try and everything. I know it's hard and it's X amount of time in the day, but, you know, if something is a useful tool and you're interested in it, you see its value, spend the weekend getting, getting your head around it. You know, I, I don't like these resumes that just, you know, have every single kind of technology listed and just okay. like, you know, I do everything. Yeah. Right. Um, so there's no need to do that. But, you know, I like the idea of, you know, someone being humble, saying these are the things I am a specialist in, but actually they've got a huge toolkit behind them and they have touched on things. Um, you know, I'm going to, again, I probably sound like these companies are just kind of like asking for the world on a stick. 
But, you know, these really are these top 1% candidates. You know, these are these holy grail people that complete change businesses. And I think if, you know, everybody aspires to those people um, and understands who those people are, I talk to those people. You know, I hear about their lives. I, you know, I track back, you know, right from childhood who they were, what they're doing. These people I've known for years, some of them, you know, and it's always the same type of person. It's somebody who's just intellectually curious. And they just absorb information. Right. They'll happily switch from one language to another. They'll pick up these technologies. They'll understand their value. They'll have things to go, oh, that's horrible. or oh, that's great. But ultimately, they see themselves as, you know, this engineer with a toolkit. And that so, toolkit will be called on to fix certain jobs. So how do you signal that you're that kind of person? <laughs> well, um, I mean, assuming you are, but you're too humble and you look like everyone else, you just say, oh, I know Java and JavaScript. But really, you love functional programming, you just haven't, don't have any professional experience, you don't feel comfortable listening it on your <laughs> resume. What do you do? You know, you've got to reverse engineer the problem. So you want to be discovered, you want to be found. Um, you know, what we do here uh, is, you know, uh, on a smaller scale, more specialized scale, Really what, you know, recruitment teams do at Facebook and Google or any of these large firms and have been doing for a long time, um, we cannot physically go and meet enough people <laughs> to meet the demand. Right. So, you know, we have to trawl through online resources. And those resources, um, if there are no signals there, you will not be found. So obviously there's the, you know, the huge, obvious, noisy places like LinkedIn but, you know, if you want to get more specialized and, you know, depend on what sort of person you're looking for, places like GitHub, you know, or even Kaggle, um, Bitbucket, I mean, you name it, the list goes on. Um, Stack Overflow, you know, this really gives us the DNA of a person. I am way more likely to find somebody with the right mindset that has been playing around with Clojure, um, may not done much with it, but the signal is there. I have a look through their repository. I've got a good idea of their background. I've seen the sort of things they've done in the past. I've seen how kind of engaged they are with the community. But for some reason, there's a little thing in closure here. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what that is. That is how I found you because I'm looking for those sorts of signals. And I really wouldn't underestimate, you know, how advanced, you know, search methods are. If you are a good engineer, just leave a breadcrumb trail. And you will be found. Just be active. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the most obvious, horrible one is LinkedIn, and you're going to get a lot of noise. But you know, if you just get on with your life on GitHub, contribute to things. I mean, I was spending maybe you know, a good two days early in a week just going through contributors to the React um, uh, the JS stuff uh, Facebook are doing, right. and you know, it's just for another client, but. It was you know, really interesting just kind of diving into that community you know, and hadn't really looked into this area before and seeing who all you know, the main figures are, completely dissecting teams at Facebook and seeing who do, these people were and seeing what they, who right. they, where they came from and then also seeing recent hires that they had made and then looking at their repositories and understanding, oh, that's probably how Facebook found them. You know? And now they've been consumed into that group and now active part of that technology. So, you know, it's, it's, you've got to think of it that way around, you know. It's like there is somebody in a cool team somewhere looking for you. But if you don't create the signal, you won't be found. And, you know, some people like to be a ghost, and that's fine. But, you know, you can't then complain that you're not engaged in the community or you're not being found or these things don't come to you. You'll have to then be extremely proactive, you know. Okay. Uh, let's see. I have some more questions. So uh, do you see the closure job market is growing it is growing um it is slow ish again that's relative uh -huh. um to other more mainstream languages um however I, although it's slow the, the quality of companies is high uh if there was that's a a pattern or a trend or something that i could see it's that the types of companies that are deciding to use Clojure 
um, I don't know if it is a, a thing <laughs> or if it's just a coincidence, but you know, they do seem to be businesses that are managing, you know, kind of complex data. Um, okay. I've had a few teams in like financial institutions that were building uh, new uh, systems in Clojure and asked why. And they, you know, talked a lot about time series data and the kind of tooling and database technology that comes with Clojure, um, Datomic as an example. Um, they talked about you know, the types of data that they're manipulating and accessing and using at scale, you know, it really lent itself well to this technology. And um, some of the startups that we've been working with, again, you know, this is a lot of very, um, a lot of very powerful data analytics, either for you know ad tech or online marketplaces. Um, there are some bigger names out there. Um, I think even Groupon we're using the technology. So there have been some like larger cases of it, but on a smaller scale, the ones that are coming through are you know using you know, large scale deployed services. Uh -huh. manipulating data, needing access to user data, and it's not often just simple numerical data. It is often financial data, time series data, personal profile data. Um, I mean, for us, you know, like us, you know, the reason we chose um, the, the language here and the move to Datomic was this time series element of, you know, the information that we're storing. Right, and, and you're referring to access. your website? Functional works, absolutely. You know, it's important for us to, be able to track data, user data. There's a lot of, there's a huge amount of resource there for us to um, to take advantage of. And if we're not actually collecting the data in the right way, you know, in the future, we're not going to be able to have any kind of record of how things have changed over time. Right. So, you know, for us, you know, that was the reason. And you know, that's something we do see reflected in the market. The types of businesses that have chosen this technology have been a little bit more angled towards user data um, and you know this kind of not all just e-commerce stuff but the ones that have been larger sort of scaled you know platforms have been a little bit more orientated towards e-commerce but um, there's definitely a, a little pattern that we're seeing which is good that's high quality work it's interesting technology um, it's non-trivial right and it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a concern meaning it's a, an area of focus for closure, that it looks like it's finding a niche for itself. Is that? Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's probably a little bit too early to tell if that really is going to be a trend. Okay. But um, the good thing is that you know, although you know, coming back to that original question, although you know, it may be slow, it's high quality, and I think we'd rather it get adopted to be doing interesting things. So the work is interesting, you know. A big round of funding and you know a two three man team can suddenly be 20 30. right um, so you know having a good business with a good business model building actually interesting technology that's like i say solving non-trivial problems using that technology suddenly gets a big round of funding then you know we've got a success story there okay so good employers doing interesting work growing slower than other systems but still growing it's definitely growing. Um, we have pretty good eyes on the market. You know, we're always having a look at what's going on out there. Um, you know, people should do the same. Uh, you know, obviously that's what we're trying to build here you know, as a resource for software engineers to come back to and keep track of the market, see who's doing what. Um, I think there's um, a couple of interesting uh, resources out there. I think Stackshare.io. Um, uh -huh. It's again it hasn't had a huge amount of a uh, attraction yet but you know they're building momentum you know, it's a great place for companies to go share information about what technologies they're using um so it gives a little bit of transparency you know seeing some trends you know who's doing what um there's a lot of slack groups out there i think you know if people get into the right ones i think functional programming slack has five six thousand members now cool you know who's using closure <laughs> you know people are going to get back to you so I think, um, yeah, there's a, it's definitely a gradual momentum. And I think if people do make a little bit of effort to get involved in those little communities, join those platforms, um, then they'll see you know, this slow, slow increase uh, over time. Um, so this is kind of maybe a, a selfish question because, you know, my, my business is, is training people and mm -hmm. often with training, 
it's because a company wants to grow their team very quickly uh, and they don't feel like the normal kinds of training, which just happens by osmosis, you know, pairing and just mm -hmm. passive stuff is going to work for them. Um, but then I also worry, this is, you know, like I said, it's a selfish question. I also worry that closure is not that hard to learn and the teams are super productive staying small. And so do you, do you have any feeling about like the average size of the closure teams at companies, um, whether, whether there is some kind of, you know, I, I'm thinking of these Java teams that are like 200 people and they're being um, shown up by a small team of say 10 closure programmers. Is, do you see that happening? Am I imagining this? What do you? What, what's your take on this? Um, in essence, you're correct. However, you may be, you know, you may be attributing it attributing it to something else. I think you know, if you think about the quality of the companies that you're probably engaging with, and the caliber of engineer they're hiring, um, of course there are. You know, there's a little bit of a connection with the amount of productivity, the amount of code you can actually get out, you know, well-written uh, functional code. So there's a little bit of a connection there. But really what you'll find is, you know, a great engineer will be 10 times as productive as, you know, a not so great engineer. Um, and the filter of the firms that you may be thinking about may actually be more of a reason that you feel that smaller teams are being a lot more productive. I will completely agree. I mean, with all the businesses that we work with and they come in all different sizes, um, you know, we very rarely see, you know, an actual team of people that's, you know, larger than a dozen. Um, obviously, you know, there are structures out there that can have many of these teams in parallel. Um, but I think there's a certain size which, you know, a certain team can be you know can really be managed and run well um that being said you know can i really connect it to the functional element you know I mean, if i really it, was it, honest i think it was more to do with the caliber of the engineers right um, right i think more likely yeah i think there's there's something to that too that it's not closure per se it's not like closure mm -hmm. just makes 10 people like 200 people right? <laughs> Um, Again, it comes back to this legacy element. You know, there are systems there out there that have been running for, you know, 15, 20, I mean, God knows, how longer years. And just the sheer scale of, you know, these systems and the problems and, you know, it's just some old Java system. Right. Then, yeah, we need 30 people to help do this thing. Um, Closure is just not there at that scale you know, in the mainstream. Right. So it's just unlikely that you're going to find this massive system that's going to require, you know, quite the headcount. Um, although I hate, keep coming back to, to Scala, but, you know, that is something that, you know, you, you know if you fast forward 10 years for closure, look at where Scala is now. There are teams like that. Um, you know, there are large legacy systems. Yeah, you know, and there'll be, you know, a bunch of okay engineers you know bashing away scala code to maintain you know something huge that you know is too big and they can't fail anymore but they can't change it this is it they're stuck with it and you know there if you compared that to these you know, small little teams that you're talking about you know, it, it could be comparable to a kind of java um legacy system so i think it's um there's a lot of factors there combined but i wouldn't say you know it's directly related to closure if maybe only just due to its naive, you know, how immature it is so far in the market. Right. Perhaps. All the projects are relatively new. They've just been written. There's <laughs> not a lot of uh, spaghetti yet that, that people have to, to deal with. So I said there's a, yeah, it's a little bit less. Yeah. So I think that's probably a little bit of a factor. But I think, you know, it's a, it's a good technology space. Um, it is going in the right direction. Um, now, as is the case with many things in life, if you just really invest in it, you know, truly and honestly, and everybody comes together, there will be a large net effect. Um, 
the people that have used it successfully are, you know, huge supporters of it and have not regretted their decisions. You know, we, we don't really see any big disasters and people running away from it, which ironically we do a lot more with Scala. Um, I know it can be a little bit divisive and polarizing, but um, you know, there's been a lot of famous situations and projects that have just you know, fallen apart. People say, right, forget that. Um, that was a disaster. I'm just going back to Java or another you know, more strongly typed language. So I think um, you know, closure. We don't see that again. This is a it's such a young language Still that new, yeah. Has, yeah hasn't had time to fail perhaps. But um, you know, we don't really see or hear about things like that happening you know, in that space. So I think it's uh, I think it's positive. Great, great. So um, I mean, I know. I mean, I guess as a recruiting firm. It's just a guess, but you're mm-hmm. always looking for good candidates. Um, do you have enough? Are you just closing your doors and you're saying we can work with what we have? Do you want new candidates? What's going on? Well, that, that'll be a good day. Um, yes, we are unfortunately drowning in work. Um, and although that may be frustrating for some engineers to hear when they don't seem to be able to get jobs or don't seem to get the interviews or the traction, um, you know, this comes back to our point that you know people need the top five percent, you know, right. coders. Right. And um, you know, I often find it quite ironic that people do complain about recruiters and the noise and you know, semi bad recruiters. Um, you know, have a little feel for some of the recruiters out there because there's a lot of terrible engineers. <laughs> it takes a lot of time uh, to get through those. Um, so I think, you know, if everybody could go out there and just really, really work on their skills and become awesome engineers, you know, it's going to really help the situation. Um, we are always, always looking for more software engineers. Um, the work, I would say there's, oof, at the top of my head, maybe... 20 or 30 open roles for every engineer um, that we wow. have. Wow. Well, this is exactly what puts the salaries up. You know, this is why it's probably you know, one of the best industries to be working in at the moment. No, um, wait, wait, so wait, wait. Let me, let me just emphasize that. You're saying there are 20 to 30 open positions for every engineer you find. Oh, absolutely. If we, could, if we had 20 to 30 more of the right quality software engineer come in the doors right now, there's enough work for all of them. Wow. Okay. So how do people do that? Do they submit you their resume? Like what? what what's yes. Um, so you know, the platform is designed to you know once you kind of build your profile, and we have a you know a fantastic kind of product you know list you know that we're still working on, and um, yeah, people will start to see that functionality creep in you know over the coming months. But the idea fundamentally is that you know once you build a profile. You, know, you shouldn't ever really have to write a resume again. You know, we're going to pull information that's important to employers. You know, the employers want to, yes, see where you went to school or where you worked perhaps, but actually the projects you work on um, and perhaps what people think of you <laughs> actually are bigger signals. So, you know, pulling information from, say, your GitHub repos, seeing how people have engaged with your work, right. um, you know, connecting you to awesome engineers that you maybe worked with in a previous company. These are data points that are actually a little bit more important. So, you know, coming back to that React, you know, uh, environment I was talking about earlier, you know, seeing somebody who's moved on from that group and has gone to a friend startup and then a year later it fails, the signal for an employer is maybe actually a little bit further back in his timeline. Right. But, you know, that, that project will stand out you know, on this kind of modern resume is, well, look what this guy helped contribute to, you know. And I think this is the idea. And, you know, if we could get, you know, every software engineer in the world to come in and just connect themselves, you know, from their online work, that will be a populating profile that will just, you know, provide them visibility, you know, um, and for clients to come and have a look so, at that data. So you mentioned creating a profile. You're talking about on your site, on functional.works. Okay. Well, functional works, yes. So um, it's, you know, at the moment, it is a very private space for a software engineer to come and basically just come and look at all our clients. <laughs> you know, we deliberately decided that, you know, we'll be completely transparent. A lot of recruitment companies would think that's crazy. Um, so, you know, you have to be approved 
you know, before you're allowed in. But, you know, that if you are writing code and you have things publicly visible, you'll be automatically approved. Okay. Um, the idea is, you know, we want, like we say, the bottleneck is the candidates. You know, we want everybody to come in and see what's out there. Um, and then just, you know, finally balancing the amount of work to the number of candidates. You know, like I said, there's no shortage of work. We could onboard, you know, another thousand companies if we wanted, but there's not enough talent. Right. So for us, the problem is, can we create a, a powerful enough tool, a useful enough product that software engineers are going to get it and go, actually, this is a great space. Uh, again, it's kind of like chicken and egg scenario, but, you know, it kind of feeds Pretty itself. Tough. So far, you know, it's been 100% growth year on year, so things are going definitely the right way. Um, but, you know, we've got this yeah, long list of products that we want to add and functionality. And, you know, for me, it really is this idea that you shouldn't be writing resumes. You certainly shouldn't be writing resumes into a document. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're a software engineer. People want an interactive interface to understand who you are, what you've done. Um, it should be an experience. We have very obvious, strong quantitative as well as qualitative you know points that can kind of describe what you are then you know this future point is to you know create a little bit more flexibility in how private this network is we think people candidates should be able to decide whether or not they can be discoverable um there are obviously hundreds of businesses there looking for people and you know for us and what we're working on very hard now is you know that data analytics technology that really helps grab those signals and allow companies and candidates, vice versa, to understand what's right for them. Much like how you log on to Amazon, you get a very personal experience based on what you've right. been doing, <laughs> whatever that is, um, and you know what you're probably going to be interested in. Um, you know, I look at somebody else's Amazon page and I'm like, whoa, what's that? That's crazy. This is exactly what we want. You know, we want people who are interested in the space, who are engaging in the space, you know, that data is going to, you know, affect how they experience the site. Sort of companies they're going to be able to, you know, be promoted to them and the sort of news they'll see. It's about just kind of creating these, you know, circles that you move in and, you know, reflecting that, you know, on the platform. It all comes from this transparency element. You know, the recruitment and a company hiring somebody will happen as a byproduct of people just sharing information. And that is what's missing in this recruitment space is that all of that information in that gray area is held privately by recruiters to enable them to facilitate you know, this exchange, um, which is fine. And you know, there's a lot of very important information that recruiters hold, but to really let it scale and solve the global problem that we have, which is we can't connect all these people together, um, you know, transparency in technology is actually going to be the way that we allow this to happen on a, on a wider scale. So um, what you've been saying has been making me think, uh, does, does any particular group of programmers have an advantage, like demographics, I mean, like older programmers, younger programmers, you know, you mentioned knowing the fundamentals and, and being able to do maybe the, the writing good code, that takes a lot of time mm. to develop the skill. Um, um, it's an interesting question. And again, you know, although this would be a broad... Like, are there enough internships, I guess? Is the... uh, I think uh, the US is, you know, a great example of, you know, uh, companies there are extremely proactive. Um, I mean, they're courting engineers, uh, I mean, before they even go off to university now. Um, some of them are actually building their own universities. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's a great example. I think company, uh, so countries like you know, the UK, uh, England and the UK yeah, really are behind. Um, there are a couple of universities that have introduced, you know, sandwich courses that ensure you go off into industry and do some work before you graduate, which I think is, you know, absolutely critical. Um, but really, I feel as if you know our top tier institutions here are really relying a lot more on their branding and their reputations from a historical standpoint uh -huh. than actually helping you know engineers get the skill sets they need, get the exposure to the industry they need. Um, to a point that you know I really feel without you know this very very you know efficient and extensive recruitment industry, um, 
I think, you know, we would probably stagnate a little bit here. Um, you know, we move talent all around the world, uh, especially around Europe. Um, and I'll say the UK's tech scene is very much being supported by European talent. Um, ironically, given uh, the recent Brexit vote. <laughs> so I think, you know, the US obviously is a huge market and it's massive. So it's a little bit easier um, to kind of, you know, with a lot of funding, just produce more software engineers. Um, but, you know, I think uh, getting people in Sorry, um, I do not believe there is a... a um, sorry, so yeah, going back to your point about, you know, is there enough training and resources or internships? You know, I think the younger, the better. Um, maybe not pulling kids out of school to go to work, but in terms of training, um, learning to code, um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, when I have kids, they will be looking at code at the same time as which they're looking at words sure. to read. Um, sure. so, so I think yeah. that is something that is going to actually happen. So are there enough internships out there? I mean, you, you mentioned before 20 to 30 times the number of jobs as programmers. Is that the same for internships? Like if someone wanted to make closure their first language, they're just starting out of college or out of a boot camp, should they do that? Is that a good move for them career-wise? Um, from a candidate's perspective, I think, you know, of course, getting out there, getting exposure is very important. And there isn't really much that could go wrong with doing that. Um, the problem is, you know, the industry as a whole. And like I say, although the U.S. is a lot more advanced in this and has a lot more businesses able to do that, um, you know, for the U.K. and smaller, you know, smaller um, economies, the, the ability to onboard and you know, get anything productive out of a, an intern um, in such a tight market, you know, it makes it tough. And, you know, the main internship programs here are main, yeah, pretty much all with U.S. firms. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's not, you know, of course, you know, a complete picture, but in general, um, in technology, it's tough, you know. You, you need to create incentives for businesses, and that really needs to come, you know, with uh, more from a political standpoint. Um, there needs to be, you know, some sort of uh, recompense there and, um I guess it's hard because I think it sounds, it sounds really horrible, but you know, unfortunately, we do just live in a commercial world. You know, businesses need to make money; they need to solve problems, and you know, yeah, just bringing in you know twenty kids to give them some experience, the likelihood of actually getting anything productive out of that is actually you know pretty low. Um, so I think you know, an organised program where you know there are actually uh, there's actually a little bit more organisation around it. I'm talking about the UK here. You know, I think would be very very useful. Um, and, you know, perhaps looking at some of the, the more kind of commercial, you know, uh, systems that exist in the U.S., you know, could be very useful. But, you know, in, in general, I think, you know, there, there, there are a lot of options out there um, with the big name firms. But, you know, you want to do an internship because you want to play around the closure. And most of closure is sitting in the startup scene. Well, these startups just are not, you know, in a situation where they can really kind of do that at scale. So that's probably what people are feeling they're looking into it right as well i also feel um so, you know some of my my audience's pain they are older they have a family mm. um mm. and they've applied for jobs and also been turned away because they're too old because there's no there's, they call it a culture fit right that they're <laughs> not going to stay up late and code all mm. night and um you know put in that that kind of startup hours when they have a family uh, so yeah. but it sounds like what you're saying is that there is a, a more demand for this older more experienced programmer who uh, can think can think more than about just the, the language and how to mm -hmm. how to get mm -hmm. like small things done they're thinking bigger picture I think you know there is you know there's always going to be a need for domain experts um, you know, I do understand what those people are describing. Um, it's a tricky one here. You know, it's, again, my situation where I sit in the market, you know, I get a lot of visibility on this stuff. And, you know, I don't think I'll be being truthful. I didn't say there were 
you know, some biases in the market. Um, they stem from different, you know, kind of reasons. Some can just be financial. Um, you know, bootstrap startup knows they can get, you know, three, four, five uh, juniors in, you know, 50, 60, 70% cost. And we'll probably be able to solve the problems that they have. Um, you know, it's only, you know, when you really do have a you know, domain specific problem that, you know, you, you kind of, you know, stretch your budget and go, okay, this is how much it's going to cost to solve this problem. So that's uh, a part of it. Um, this idea of kind of like culture fit. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, again, you know, we understand our businesses so well and, you know, there, there are businesses that we think, you know, this person probably isn't going to get hired here based upon maybe biases like that. Now, we don't want to propagate those, um, but they are there and we shouldn't ignore them. And I think, you know, it's important for businesses to kind of see value you know, in people um, and, you know, not, I guess, propagate these issues. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit of a minefield. And I think, you know, as we build this technology that we're building, it's something that's really important to us is, you know, the ethics behind um, all of it. You know, if a company is able to build algorithms that, you know, ultimately not find signals, but remove people from what they're looking for, you know, it's very possible for these sort of biases to creep in. Right. Mm. So, yeah, I think it, it, there is, there is that element. Um, it's not a simple story. It's complicated. But, um, you know, I, I've had recently, you know, people not being able to join companies um, due to yeah, children, family restrictions and things like that. And, you know, two, three months of process and a lot of time and energy involved, um, you know, those companies if I bring somebody else to the table that looks similar, they will ask those questions now. You know, they're like, well, what's going to happen? You know, is this guy serious? You know, this woman serious? What's happening? And, you know, unfortunately, that is what kind of creates these issues and they do kind of escalate um, from past experience. But, hey, here's the world we live in. You know, we make decisions, we make choices. You know, I myself need to be competitive. You know, if there's a 22-year-old stud that's going to come in and just, you know, work all day and nail it, then, you know... I've got to go back to my wife, then what can we do? <laughs> right, right. Okay, so let's wrap up. Um, I just want to like go over just like a, a, a few points that we talked about um, to make sure that, that these get drilled home. So you're saying people need to make sure they're focusing on the fundamentals. The language is not so important. And you actually encourage employers to not look so much at language experience as much as um, how how well people think, are they skilled, can they learn new things, that kind of thing. Um, you're saying, I, I'm still, this number still baffles me, 20 to 30 times as many jobs as programmers. I mean, it's interesting that you find that figure shocking because that's a very, very modest um, estimate. Right. Well, because the reason I find it shocking is because I have so many people asking me, are there enough jobs? I searched for closure and I only found, you know, a handful. And I searched for Java and there are just millions. And um, I mean, that kind of brings me to another uh, question. Um, someone mentioned that they feel locked into closure. They mm -hmm. worked hard, they found a job in closure, they took it. And now they feel like that was the only closure job, and mm. um, I'm locked in. Like I can't, I can't move okay. forward. I can't, um, I can't quit this job. I can't lose it because then I won't have another one. Yeah, I understand. Um, okay, I think I understand your uh, your shock at that figure. I mean, I wasn't talking about just closure there. I was talking about all of our clients that work okay, across country okay. programming. Yeah, right. um, so that probably ex that explained that. Um, so, I mean, we still do have too many closure jobs for people. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's probably not quite as high. But um, it's probably – we still probably have a five to ten uh, still, openings really that, we, that okay. we're trying to fill, yeah, uh, per person. So, yes, I – well, you know what? I know exactly what you're talking about because I talk to these people and they say the same thing. But the problem is, you know, they live – in you know austin 
you know, or Chicago or whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, there's only three companies there. You know, somebody's willing to relocate and move to a big hub. Um, you know, he's going to go to San Fran or New York, you know, or something where, you know, there's you know, a lot of business, then your options are going to significantly increase. Um, you know, we work all across the US. Uh, we engage with people every single corner. And, you know, if somebody's, you know, keen or happy to move to, say, New York, guess what? The world is your oyster. You know, you're asking exactly what we've got in the kind of, you know, Midwest region. You know, it's tough. So I think, you know, yeah, there's not a huge number of jobs and there is maybe a little bit of a feeling of being locked in. But um, I think if you engage with, uh, you know, the right recruiters, uh, you keep an eye on these, you know, resources like Stack Share, uh, things like that. Um, you engage with, you know, Slack communities. Um, I think you'd be quite surprised at what's out there. Typing into Google, what's out there is you really just relied on somebody who's written job spec and then put it online somewhere. Um, why is it going to say closure? You know, there's a lot of businesses right. that we work with that you wouldn't actually know they even use closure. So, you know, you need to kind of get under the surface a little bit. You know, I mean, I know I keep saying it, but literally go on a Slack group and ask people right. who use Closure. Right. And you're going to get some, some random person who's at some company saying, yeah, we use it. So you're and saying you have that no in idea, 2017 you have to talk to people to find things? <laughs> Unbelievably so, yeah. It's almost as if that's what we do for a living as recruiters to go and find this information. <laughs> but yeah, and people just forget sometimes. They think Google is the be all and end all, but you know, actually information is hidden in people. Um, yeah, and that's what that's our market. That's what we do. We extract the information um and you know help connect people that way. So I think Slack is, you know, a really powerful community tool and you know you can stick it on your laptop, um, stick it on your phone. You know, join maybe two or three channels and you're going to instantly feel, you know, very, very connected to your community. And people on there are, you know, they're very helpful. It's a positive place. I personally have, you know, exited most social networks over the years. Um, and I think Slack is, you know, it's a, if you can get your notification set up the right way, you know, it can be um, yeah, a very good experience. So I think, you know, get in there, ask questions, engage. Um, I promise it won't just be me <laughs> answering. And um, yeah, I think once you scratch me for surface, you'd be surprised that you know there are teams out there, you know, using the tech. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nick. This has been great. So, where can people find you online? Where can they find Functional Works? Tell us all about that. So yeah, um, come say hello, functionalworks.com. Um, like I say, if you're active online and you have code and things in your GitHub, then you'll be automatically let in otherwise you know we can approve you pretty quickly um so come in say hello um we have pretty much been built upon community feedback um every decision we make is based off of you know surveys and engagement so come in tell us what's broken tell us what's good tell us what's bad um you know, we'd love to hear from you and um who knows you may end up finding you know a, a great job uh, at the end of it as well Right, and I mean, you could actually transition your career to functional programming, like it's big enough now. Absolutely, I mean, you know, if you have these, you know, the strong principles there, you've got the foundation, get involved, come in, have a look, engage, ask questions, you'll be surprised, you know, people are very happy to facilitate that transition. Um, if you have those skills, and you have that, you know, foundation, that's on you, you know? Awesome we can do about that bit but we can provide the platform um and that's you know introduction we can do everything else for you uh, and you know comp uh, uh, places like that and platforms like ours are a perfect place to do that exploration so yeah bring your skills and um you know we can make that happen for you awesome thank you nick uh, it's great talking to you thank you so much and uh, yeah best of luck just take care bye, -bye.